All right, I'm back with some news in Linux. Mainly, we're going to be checking out statistics today from some of the largest projects in Linux. Since it is the beginning of a new year, we get access to all the stats from the previous year. So I'm super excited about this one. But first, I want to talk about Debian installer Trixie Alpha 1 release. That's right. The Debian team has announced the first alpha release of the installer for Debian 13, codenamed Trixie. The foreword here is, I'd like to address special thanks to Holger Wansing, who has done a tremendous job wading through many proposed changes in the various installer components in addition to coordinating translational efforts. This is exciting news for all of you Debian users as the first test of the new Trixie or Debian 13 installer is now released. There have been high level and important changes made and those major changes on the hardware support side of things. We're no longer building an installer for the ARM L and I386 architectures, even if they remain in the archive at the moment. The MIP cell architecture was removed from the archive last year and a new announcement, the RISC V64 architecture is brand new. The boot screens remain unchanged, but there is a new theme called the Ceratopsian theme by Elise Cooper that is making their debut in the installer. Finally, we see a major overhaul dealing with the creation of the root user and the first user that being saying themselves received an overdue makeover. We all know how confusing it could get during the installer trying to make a root and standard user. Well, I'm excited to see how they've improved. Of course, there's a bunch of bug fixes, including components for partitioning, different heuristics for automatic partitioning, like computing the swap size. That's a question that many people ask, how big do I need to make my swap size? Well, hopefully we have that answer now based on some metrics. All right, now on to some statistics. The Steam Hardware and Software Survey was released for December 2024, which gives us a little bit of information about the most typical used hardware and operating systems. So currently the most popular operating system is of course Windows with an uptick of 6% over the year, with an uptick of 6% of users moving to Windows 11 from, well, Windows 10 for the most part, as we can see a 5% deficit in Windows 10 64-bit. But what we're most interested in is Linux. Linux has seen a 0.3% raise in users coming from various different Linux distributions. Hardware statistics go like this. System RAM, 16 gigs. Most people use 16 gigs with nearly 45% of people having that amount, at least on the gaming desktop side of things. When it comes to cores, six cores, and most people use the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060. Funny enough, I just got one myself, not based off of these statistics, but purely because I found a good deal. VRAM is eight gigs, primary display resolution, vast majority using 1920 by 1080, and a majority of people now have over one terabyte of storage space. Now, one of the most interesting things that I've seen is on the processor usage details side of things. On Windows, we've seen quite a change in which processor is being used over the months, especially in the month of December. As a lot of people did their holiday shopping, they chose to go AMD instead of Intel. A huge 5% gain in the AMD market over the last month, at least for gaming desktop PCs. Anyways, very interesting going from 33% to 38% here and Intel falling close to 3% of the market share in December alone. And some more interesting statistics when it comes to Xorg. Xorg, commonly referred to as the X server or X11 server, is a long-standing project which provides a graphical environment for windowing systems and is highly used in Linux as it is primarily the default display server unless you're using Wayland, which more and more distributions seem to be going to. And a major reason for that, as we're gonna look through the statistics, is the fact that the project seems to be stagnating. But what do the statistics say? We're gonna look through this, but before we do, take a moment to smash that like button for me. It really helps the video get out to more people, as well as think about subscribing below for more videos like this in the new year. You wouldn't wanna miss another one. First, we're gonna look at hours of the day. What this means is, at what hour do most people create commits? And that's here, the 14th hour of the day or 2 p.m., depending on how you look at it. That seems to be the most prominent hour, the day where most commits are made, not by a lot, but closer to 3,500 commits throughout the year appeared on Thursday. The main month out of the year that the commits were made were on the fourth month or April. Seems like a lot of productivity in April. We'll also see how this compares soon to the Linux kernel. Also, thanks to Pharonix for supplying this information. The Git stats turned out really well this year. As we can see, the trend of XOR commits over the years. Now, this doesn't tell the full tale as it's based on commits, but not necessarily how much code was added or subtracted from the project. But it still tells us a good story about over the years, how the XORG project has grown and shrunk. We can tell 
In the early years, in 03 through 04 into 05, we started seeing a slow growth. And that growth kept happening with some of the biggest growth happening somewhere in the 2008-2009 era. And with this growth, we started seeing a slower, more steady decline before we reached a area where we pretty much had stagnating growth and it kind of leveled off before falling off and trailing back up. And now we're kind of in a stagnation period again. At least that's the prediction here. What has happened over the years is Xorg has slowly fallen off. And with another competitor, Wayland, that has come to the scene, a lot of modern distros have actually made the switch to Wayland. I did a video about Wayland and in Linux. If you want to check that out, I'll put it in the description below as it's getting a lot of engagement, but it seems like maybe in this period of time, Wayland was doing the best, which is between the 07 to 010 period of time, we'll call it. The adoption, however, is a whole different story. I mean, Sorg has definitely been the primary windowing server, at least on Linux, for quite a while, with Wayland being introduced a long time ago as Wayland only gained attention somewhere in like 2010 period, but has made massive strides. So is the Xorg project dying? Well, this right here, this massive amount of commits made in 2024, seems to say a different tale. It doesn't seem to be dying, but when we look into this closer, what we start to realize that this is really just one person making all the commits. As it hit a high for a decade in 2024, it had 708 commits last year, and the last time anything was even close was like in 2018, where we saw around 500 or so commits. So this is around 708. Well, the main reasons here is first off, X Wayland code lives within the X server project and has been actively being developed. And the other reason is Enrico Waglet has been largely working on X or server fixes, who has given around 63% of the 708 commits. That really skews these numbers as really the majority of the commits have been made by only one person. As the Xorg server is a matured project, there's still many developers maintaining and developing. But I feel like we're just going to continue in stagnation as Wayland is seeing massive growth, growth through the years. Another great graph here to kind of show you the commits versus the year instead of by month is this graph right here, which definitely shows us the averages and how that bell curve really has occurred. And now we're kind of either stagnating, maybe growing just a little bit, but I think we're going to stagnate back down over the coming years. Anyways, very interesting statistics to view. Again, thanks for Onyx for that. But now I want to get into even more exciting statistics to look at. The Linux kernel and how its commit activity with Git stat has gone throughout the year and years. You can see by week how many commits were made. It's pretty wild how many commits get made with over 4,000 people who commit to the project. It's no wonder that we can get thousands of commits per week. Out of the 32 week period, it seems like these two weeks, 19 and 18, were the most popular for making commits. Moving on to hours of the day, it's really a close call with most people committing code around the 9th and 10th hour. So 9 through 10 a.m. is the most popular time to receive commits. Again, you got to think this is all over the world. So the mornings make sense for most people to be doing their code submissions. Another interesting thing is that Tuesday is actually the most popular day to submit code, different from the Xorg, which was Thursday, but many more developers here. Wednesday's a close second at 18.17%. In 2024, we see that the two most prominent months are the third month and the 10th month, meaning October and March for development as the most commits were made. Just keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily mean the most code was added or subtracted. It just means the most amount of commits were made. So that's when the most amount of people were active making commits, if that makes any sense. Anyways, all very close, but three and 10 are the clear winners. And the difference is 0.03% between those two months. All right, this graph did not come out that great commits by year per month. So I went and made my own, I can show you. Although it's hard to see, we're gonna go through this together. We can see that over the last, well, almost 20 years. So the way this worked is if we look over from the right-hand side, this is 2005, it's hard to see, and we work our way up to 2024. Each month is a bar, and we can see here at the start of, well, at least the Git statistics, we started somewhere around the 1,000 mark of commits and worked our way up, and it's been steadily increasing over the years. If we kind of look at the averages here, we've sort of peaked out maybe around the 2016 period and have remained with steady growth up until 
you know, as of recent, we didn't really see many commits over the last couple months. It's quite an interesting number as we're seeing a decade low in 2024, at least for the number of commits for the year, with extraordinary amount of commits not being made in the last few months of the year. The 2024 period of time really happens right through here to here. So basically, if we take all the averages of all these commits somewhere in, well, let's just call it here, and we average that across the last 10 decades, we'll see that there's less commits being made in 2024. Now, that doesn't mean that code isn't being produced because it is a surprise that fewer or lower commits are made this year, as you could even compare back in like 2023, where around 88,000 commits were made, only 75,000 were made this year. But that doesn't necessarily tell the full story because if you, for example, look at Linus Torvalds accepting emerging commits, you can see that they've steadily grown over the last decade as it did dip a little bit over this last year, but overall from 3120 in 2012 to 4807 in 2024. This also doesn't give a full view of exactly how many code lines were added or subtracted as it just is commits. Even though more code may have been created this year, that doesn't necessarily get represented in this chart, but it's still very interesting to view because there's been around 3.7 million lines of new code in the Linux kernel, 1.5 million lines removed, and that's definitely comparable to prior years as well. Maybe we're getting a little more efficient at programming, but regardless, this is all fantastic statistics to go through from a year-to-year -year basis. So we can see the pulse of the Linux kernel as well as other open source projects. I'm always excited to go through statistics like this. And if you are as well, and you want more videos like this, make sure to smash that like button for me. And since you made it to the end of the video, please take a moment to subscribe below. Clearly you like videos like this, you might as well follow along for more. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.